Welcome, I'm Roy Richmond, and we are Tree of Life Ministries and all of us here welcome you to our home by way of Facebook and those that will be coming later on and watching that, also YouTube and my other resources. The best way to find out my resources uh, is my web page is dr like doctor, Roy, E as in Edward, richmond.com and you'll find all kinds of links there if you want to support the ministry and what we do, there's a link for that. But there's all kinds of uh, PDF files available, books, and uh, I'm on every, almost every podcast platform. So we have a lot of things that you can reach out to. But we're looking at Isaiah chapter 11 today. And uh, I have never heard another minister preach on Isaiah 11, but I'm sure there have been. But my pastor back in 1996 to about 2003 Gary Garner, actually in 1988 when he taught it, he taught Isaiah 11 and he called it the restoration of the remnant. And Isaiah 11 talks about uh, eight different places that people went off to and talking about the Jewish people. And so we've talked about that a lot in the past and we taught it as sinners that left the church and we've got to teach them about the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and get them to come back in. But that's not what it's about. And so... Uh, we're looking at the allegorical, we're looking at the metaphysical, the spiritual understanding of this because that's how it will affect us today. Hi, Norma. Hi, Kay. Online. <laughs> Everybody's looking at the door. <laughs> You're going to think I'm seeing ghosts, aren't you? <laughs> One of our new ladies there looked at the front door when I said that, but I can see who's coming on, so I always say hi to a lot of them. Sometimes they don't want me to say hi, so they go away real quick. <laughs> like, I don't want people to know I'm watching you. But but it's it's a it's, it was one of my favorite series that I went through with Brother Garner's and uh, I always enjoyed teaching it and I was going to republish it from the redemptive view the way we taught it but I felt prompt by spirit that I needed to teach the metaphysical understanding of this because it is powerful and it's very viable today because you can tell all over the world there are people that have gone all kinds of places and now they're coming back. And I said, I want to know the truth about the Bible because we've been lied to about it. We, we've had preachers that weren't lying, but they taught what they thought was true that wasn't true. And so I titled this, The Restoration of the Remnant of Those Who, Whom Religiosity Failed. And I don't point my finger at pastors and Sunday school teachers and all that. I point my finger at the system that they came out of. You know, Caius said this, and I've said this many times, uh, in the past, when people go to seminary school, I always call it cemetery school. And, and I'm not against the people there, but basically all they do is teach people how to die. Does that make sense? How to die properly. And so their pastors come out of there and they want to make sure that you're saved and you've, you've repented and you have nothing that God holds against you because you want to die properly. But nobody teaches how to live. Right. And I, one of my friends the other day, somebody passed away and they said she's finally at peace and I thought well why can't we live in peace you know but we're always taught to die and that's the goal and that's where we want to go and so we're not there so this is my second lesson uh, if you did not uh, get particularly if you're in the transcript club I think I sent this out to everybody you guys if you want to be on that where I can send you the PDF files every Sunday let me know those of you who are out there that are interested I can send you a link how to get that because and then you can hear it on Facebook and and YouTube. But this one is titled Hand, Vine, and Branch Ministry. The Hand Ministry, the Vine Ministry, and the Branch Ministry. So let's read from Isaiah 11:10. And sometimes sunshine, I, I'm not doing it today, but sometimes I'll read a verse and it's from my translation so it doesn't line up with the King James because I translate the Bible. So it says here in Isaiah 11:10, and that day, and we talked about that day last week or two weeks ago, and that day there shall be a root of Jesse, and literally, uh, that word, when you look it up, means my Messiah. And I'll explain it again in a minute. Which shall stand for an instant of the people. To it shall the Gentiles, and those are people who are not religiously minded. Would you agree with that? You know, we always say there are people who are not Jews, but literally, there are people who are not religiously minded. They've been in religions, but they're not, it just didn't click for them. <clears throat> right? And it says, uh, they will seek, and their rest shall be glorious. You know, and the, the rest that we, when we came to church, when we came to God or whatever, what was taught to us should brought us a glorious rest where we're never afraid of God. 
never, uh, never unsure about our future or our life whatsoever. But Isaiah said their rest will, their rest will be glorious. Verse 11, and it shall come to pass and that day that father shall set his hand ministry again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam to Sh and Shinar and Hamath and in the islands of the sea. And all those places we will be going through as we I continue to write my book on this, we continue to teach it and we'll explain each one of those cities and how they represent where people went to. And I always say, most of them went to all the wrong places looking for love or looking for love in all the wrong places. There's a song like that. So at the beginning of verse 11, we see father and where it says shell uh, almost always in the Bible. When you see the word shell, it actually means exist. You know, where it says you shall be righteous, it actually says you exist righteous. And so that's important for people to know. So we see father exists to set his hand again the second time. And to us uh, with a sign to recover the remnant of his people. And that really stood out to me yesterday. And I capitalize it because no matter where you go, no matter what you do or don't do, you're still his people. Right. Yeah. You still belong to God. Mm -hmm. Church didn't teach that. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know hardly any churches that teach that no matter what you do, if you mess up royally, if you never come and get saved or whatever they want you to do, you're still his. And what belongs to Father will always belong to Father. So the remainder are those who continue to live with a mistaken identity that was placed in them by religiosity. However, again, they are still kinshipped. And the word redeemed actually means kinship. We are, we are one with Father. If you're my kin, then you and I are one. We're, we're related, right? We've got the same DNA. And so literally when it talks about the redeemed of the Lord, I put in here, we are the kinship of the Lord. We're one with Father. And so his people. So if you are in what any of these cities spiritually speak of and you're struggling with your identity, you don't know who you are or you convince yourself that you're something that you're really not. Because sometimes we do that. We, we have all of our life, we have something's happened to us or whatever. We feel like we're this way, you know, like I feel like I'm an ice creamaholic and it's because I worked at Brahms all my life. And that's all I preach against is ice cream. You can explain it to her later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't preach against anything else, but I'm struggling with that. I still belong to Father. I'm still one with Father. I'm still righteous. I'm still holy. I'm still perfect. And if this body does lay down, I will forever be with Father, but I'm forever with Father now, yeah. right? Because Father is one, Father is spirit, we're spirit, your spirit, we're all spirit. So Isaiah used this statement a second time. So if there's a second time, there must be a first time, right? Mm -hmm. And so when was our first time? Well, the physical understanding of the first time in Isaiah was literally when the children of Israel, that Father brought the children of Israel together, if you would, and King Cyrus, uh, uh, they ended up in Babylon. They ended up in captivity. And I told this last time that King Cyrus was the king then. And somebody came to him and showed him a book that was written 800 years ago before that, him. And it said a man named King Cyrus that, that would, would, would set the children of Israel free. And I always say, if you saw that, I think a wise person would say, okay, let's set them free. And that actually happened. And so they were, uh, <clears throat> the first time they were restored, they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. Uh, Babylon had destroyed all their walls and destroyed everything. And they were uh, back to go restore their kingdom and rebuild all of that. So allegorically, the first man, a first time for a person is when you feel the need, if you would, to go to church. You feel the need to get things right with Father. Because you don't have to go to church to know about religiosity, do you? You can never, in America, you can never step, fat, uh, step foot in a church, but you're going to hear what they teach. You're going to hear about the fear of God. You're going to see things on TV. I'm so sick of them right now. They're just because of what's going on in the world. All these commercials, do you, are you going to be in heaven? I'm, I'm sure you're seeing them all. And so it produces a fear in people's lives. And so there comes a time that they feel like I need to approach God. I need to go to church. And of course we have friends that say, all you need to do is go to church and everything's going to be all right. Well, the truth is it's not. And I'm not saying don't go, but church is not your source. Father is your source. We are the church. We are ecclesia. Everybody is the church. I remember Brother Garner, my pastor 
from 96 to 1996 to 2004, he was talking about how he went to a, a conference, and we used to do those. We'd go to conferences, and seven or eight preachers would preach all week long, and it was fun, wasn't it? A lot of fun. We created, got a lot of fun, uh, friends. But he said one young lady, about 16 years old, walked down the aisle and did what they told her to do and gave her life to the Lord. And she had a glorious experience. You know, I remember my wife doing that when she was 16. Hardly ever been in church, but she had a glorious experience because she felt free because she just finally opened up and allowed spirit to minister to her, you know. And so he, was, he said, I was out mowing my lawn the next uh, Monday at home, and I was thinking about her, and all of a sudden a horror filler feeling came over me, and he, and he thought, she's going to go to church next Sunday. And I was really shocked to hear him say that, but I understood what he was saying because she's getting ready to get indoctrinated in some kind of religious belief and sin consciousness comes from that. And so am I preaching against going to church? No, but I'm saying you need to find a minister that knows some spiritual things, not just physical or carnal things because they won't help you. And Babylon means what? Confusion, that's right, Ann. She beat you this time, Donna. Donna usually gets all of them, so she gets the gold star all the time. So it means confusion. And so they left this confusion area, and they, they went back the first time, and they were supposed to rebuild the temple, but also uh, awaken to who Father really said they were and follow Father. But they didn't. They stayed in confusion. They brought, they brought confusion with them, if you would. And, so they, uh, and religiosity failed them. So they continued in great confusion, never feeling that Father really loved them, or accepted them because their religious leaders would not let them know that because they didn't feel it themselves. And as I've told you before, the nation of Israel, the leaders thought only, only the nation as a whole was a son of God, but you individually are not a son or daughter of God. And that's why they hated Jesus so much because he came and said, I am a son of God. And he taught that everybody was sons of God and, and daughters. So our first time was rolling into dust of religiosity, if you would, out in the outer court. In the tabernacle of Moses, there are three different levels. There's outer court, holy place, most holy place. We used to teach that as saved, spirit-filled, grown up. But then we realized the outer court is where people are saved, and they're just trying to keep their ticket to heaven, trying to do what's right. And then there's people there that have a smaller group of people that have been taught to redempt the work of Jesus Christ. And then it's all about what Jesus did. But then there are people that are beginning to do what Paul did, and he had an experience of being in the, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and he began to realize, oh, there's more to it than this. It's about God. It's about Father. Father's my source, not Jesus. Father is my, he's the one that provided me divine health. He's the one, and I don't like to use the word he because there is no gender there, but that's what we say all the time. And so they're, they're coming up to this more, mo, this holy place understanding and that holy place understanding is literally where you begin to live and move and have your being out of who you are. And then you find out you don't have to go to the most holy place because you already are the most holy place. You're already God's dwelling place. Amen. That makes so much sense to me. And I'm glad Father showed that to me. Amen. Yeah. So uh, we, one of my worship leaders, Judy Vandenberg, wrote a song one time about uh, don't call common what I've made clean. And then she, she, part of it says rolling in the dust, acting as carnal as anyone can. And basically that's what we do when we go to religions because we just roll in that dust and we act carnal and it's, it keeps us from raising up higher. And that's why everybody needs to be exposed to a hand ministry. That's why you are being made to be a hand ministry. If you're feeding on these truths and you're hungry for more, then you're been equipped to be a hand ministry yourself. And, and these other ministries that I'm, I'm going to talk about. So while I was searching the Hebrew uh, yesterday, uh, I was looking for the meaning of the English phrase the second time because that book was written in Hebrew, but, uh, but they put all kinds of English words there that some of them weren't right. So I found Hebrew, the Old Testament 8138 word, Shana, S-H-A-N-N-A-H, and it's pronounced Shana, and it means to transmute, which is this, in this instance, it means to change or to be transformed in your awareness. In your awareness. See, Jesus, when he went on the Mount, uh, Mount, uh, do what? 
Did that go to a commercial? That just really... I'm going to turn it off. I watched it for a long time, and it, then it just does it while I'm teaching. So <laughs> I won't do that anymore. So Jesus, when he was on the mount with, uh, with the two disciples, and he showed himself, he didn't become something he wasn't. He raised their frequency so they could see who he was. He, he, because he was always going. Did you realize you're always sunshine? <laughs> And you are always glowing because your spirit and spirit is energy. And the reason we don't see it is because we're not seeing with our single eye. We're not hearing with our single ear, if you would. But literally, we, every one of us are glowing with energy. And so there is no change in who I am. There's a change in my awareness. So I'm waking up to who I know I am. And so the hand ministry used to bring people up to the holy place uh, spirit of the day goes through this significant change in their awareness and that's what's taking place with us that's what took place with me for many many years 1988 is when father really began to put this desire to study and learn and from 88 to now it took a long time but it doesn't have to take you a long time at all because I asked father several years ago what's going to happen to these people that come to our fellowship they haven't gone through these 60 or 70 books that I've written and taught you know, it's like, you'd go, I, I would think, oh, you need to go back to book one. But, and I heard this so strong, I will give them a quick understanding. And there's scripture in there, I have found later, that says that. That if you're willing and if you're hungry, you can be given a quick understanding. How would that happen? Well, you would be taught how to connect with your divine mind. Right? right. You know, today, we have a computer. And I'm telling you, you can get a quick understanding on anything on that computer. And now you even have AI that can help you with it. And I don't say everything that AI is correct, but if you, do, you, do, you can do a search on something and it's just spitting it out real quick and you go, oh, that's what that means or whatever. So spirit, if we tap into spirit, we know all things already. So we have to allow ourselves to be transformed though in our awareness, our conscious awareness, our subconscious, or you can say your heart awareness. There has to be this yielding to the divine mind. And what do we do? We yield all of our thoughts. We yield all of our old beliefs and things like that. And we yield it to spirit and we let spirit expose that with the truth. And the truth is what will make you free. In other words, it'll cause you to experience your freedom. Some people don't want to let it go. John Cahill said this years ago, one of my pastor friends, he said, God won't take your friends from you. <laughs> right? You know, you might say, Lord, I've got a problem with chocolate ice cream and I need you to take it away from me. But if I don't confess that I ate five or six gallons of strawberry... <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of stuff that we, we think it's our friend. We think, oh, you made me this way, or it's okay for me to be, but it's hindering you, and it's hurting you, and it's traducing you, and only you can know that, because I'll never tell you, because I don't know. You know why? Because I don't look for it, and I definitely tell people, don't bring your friends here and tell me uh, all the different flavors of ice cream they eat. I don't want to hear it, right. okay? Does that make sense to you, or you think I'm crazy? <laughs> so... The second time then brings us out of the outer court. I thank God I've been through the second time. And many of you have. It brings us out of the outer court where the majority of people are just saved during works to please Father, waiting for Jesus to come back or waiting to die so they can go to heaven. And then they're always working to keep that salvation. My, my dad talked sometimes about it, how, you know, you don't want to die. Actually, my uncle... You don't want to die unless you repented for every sin that you've ever done. And so many times people would just say, Lord, if there's anything I haven't repented of, please forgive me of. Because they were, they, that's the kind of God they knew. And that's not God. My son uh, believes himself to be an atheist. And for a while it bothered me. That, but there came a time that I came to him. I said, son, I'm an atheist now. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I don't believe in that God that I was taught to believe in. I believe in a God of love. I believe in a father. I believe in a source that's nothing but love. So all that stuff that I wish I hadn't taught you or allowed to be taught to you, it's not true anymore. And he didn't believe me. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> no, Dad, I don't believe you. He does now, though. But then, there's a, then, then again, there's this smaller crowd. The big crowd in the outer court are people that are saved. And they're trying to stay saved. And they're working 
and giving their offering to be blessed and working to be blessed and all that. But then there's this smaller crowd who are still there in a different section. You could say maybe in a different church or whatever and, and, and the outer court. And uh, Donna, right down on page four, I need to correct out to outer. Sometimes I type too fast and I wrote out. But they're being taught from a false perception of Jesus's mandate, mission, and ministry. We were taught, according to the King James Version, that Jesus came and he had to die because God wanted him to die on our behalf. We were taught that. Did that ever make sense to you? And But yet we were said, well, that's the sovereignty of God. You just can't understand it. God does what he wants to. But we were taught that. And so they believed in six steps to the throne. Crucified, died very quick and raised and seated. Uh, the Paul system of truth. We were taught all that. I taught it. I was one of the big proponents of it. And then all of a sudden we came and we realized that there's something wrong there. And Kay and I, and I'm sure others, begin to research and find out that God never wanted Jesus to, to die. He didn't need him to die. The, the, the Jews wanted him to because they hated him, the Jewish leaders. And they couldn't kill him because he said, no one takes my life. I lay my own life down. So by the time they came to the cross to break his legs like the other one, he had already given up the ghost. He did it himself. I mean, if they could have killed him, they would have done it during that beating. Because that beating was terrible. And so what happens, we begin to pray to Jesus. And we, and we begin to ask him for our perceived needs. And we be coming back for more all the time. All of our songs were about Jesus. Would you agree with him? Almost all the present worship songs that you guys love and I love, they're all about Jesus. But there's nothing about God because we were taught that we can't approach God, that God's way out there somewhere. God's too big for us. So God became a man so we can know God through Jesus. And that's not true. And so these people, and I did too, desperately need this second time hand ministry to appear to them. Why do they need it? So they can hear the voice that says, come up hither. Paul was his second-hand ministry. Over and over and over, he was saying, awake to righteousness and sin not. And the word sin means don't live with a mistaken identity. Because there's only one sin, and that's not knowing who you are. If you don't know who you are, then you're going to do all that other stuff that the church called sins. You know, And when the Bible says he came to take away the sin of the world, what he came to take away is our mistaken identity. How would I take that away from you? If you, you think you're a really bad person and God doesn't love you, I would educate you, wouldn't I? I would tell you who you are and explain who you are and explain how Father has always loved you and that you were born holy and you never were not holy. And that's what Jesus came to do. But all they can do is feed me, bless me, heal me, and so forth. And so he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. And so... <clears throat> Many have heard this come up hither through the voice of a comforter messenger. You know, a comforter messenger. If, uh, Jesus said that Father would send many more comforter messengers and their teachers and leaders and guiders of truth. And they've heard that. Or they've heard from Spirit speaking through their thoughts. I mean, I've met people in Walmart and other places and I get in a conversation and I would say, did you know that you were holy when you were born and you never can lose that? And a lot of them have said, yes, I did. And I'm, I'm kind of shocked. I said, how did you know? And I said, I just knew it. God just spoke that to me. Or they'll say, my mama told me that or whatever. So you can hear it. It doesn't necessarily have to be through a preacher. Spirit can speak to you, excuse me, if you're familiar with that voice. If you listen, if you learn to listen to the voice of Father. And have you ever heard Father speak to you? What, who does it sound like? You. Inward. It's your thoughts. It, you know, it just, it just sounds like you talking, but you know it's true. It's powerful. It, it, it rivets you and it moves you. And it's, it's that twinkling of eye experience that takes place. And so uh, people are so ingrained with the teaching of religiosity, they do not hear because they're not possessing their ear to hear and they're not, not possessing their single eye, their third eye, whatever you want to call it. And so they don't hear it. And, and how can you not hear Spirit's voice? Because you're used to another voice that screams at you all the time, and it's the voice of religiosity. It's familiar, and it's recognizable, and, but the voice of Spirit is calm and quiet and gently nudges you. But, you know, uh, their songs still come to me all the time, in the sweet by and by. Sometimes I'll be driving along, and I'll hear that, and that was a precious song to me. 
one of these days, it won't be long, we're going to gather, you know, all those songs. That's the voice of religiosity, and yet we, we still kind of love them. You know, amazing grace. Who doesn't love amazing grace? But it's a bunch of bull because it calls you a wretch, <laughs> right? Saves a wretch like, I'm not a wretch. You're not a wretch. You know, so there, those, those familiar voices rob us from hearing the true voice that we need. I'm sorry I'm not looking over at you guys enough. I'm going to preach to you for a little bit, Christopher. <laughs> so, <laughs> Christopher. <laughs> Part of the Apostle Paul's letters to Ephesus, which is the, from the book of Ephesians, speaks of the need to leave darkness. So what is darkness? Huh? No That's right. No understanding. And light is understanding. So Paul several times talks about awaking to righteousness and sin not, all that stuff. Because we are light and we are to walk about and tread in our life in light and understanding. When a person that has understanding and uses understanding is powerful. And I, we used to hear that saying knowledge is powerful, but that's not true. It's doing something with your knowledge. A lot of people have knowledge and they do nothing with it whatsoever. And so the second-hand ministry is a signaling, if you would, to us to wake up from the sleep of religiosity that produced uh, in us a state of, if you would, non-existence in the cool of the day. The word cool of the day where the Bible said a uh, man walked with God in the cool of the day and then they left. It, it's a spiritual awareness. When you're in the cool of the day, it's refreshing and it's spiritual and there's great understanding that comes to you. And so what we do is we awake and then we begin to lean to our divine mind or we need to, as Kay would say, we yield to it. We, we, we have yielded ourselves to so many things today and we still do. The television, you know, I, I, I love watching my shows and stuff, but sometimes I wish I could just take it and throw it away because there's so much stuff coming at us and bombarding us constantly that literally unconsciously we yield to it because something you hear over and over and over, it becomes an, a, a real thing to you, and it produces fear. So while I was writing this chapter yesterday, I nudged, uh, I, 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 my, my spirit nudged me, if you would, to uh, research some of my spiritual books that I have, some of my ancient books that I have. And I, and I, want, I wanted to find what is our divine mind. I talk about divine mind all the time. I know it's Father, it's our source. But our divine mind knows all things. The Bible says you have an unction with the Holy One. In other words, you have contact with God. You have contact with the divine mind and you know all things. Did you know that? That you know all things? But you're just not aware yet. <laughs> but that's what the Bible actually says. And the word Christ is contact. So literally you have contact with the Holy One and you know everything. But we're just not aware yet. And so when I looked it up, I found several different things. I just went in there and put what is our divine mind in some of the places. One of them says it's God mind. The other one says it's ever present, the all-knowing mind, the absolute, the unlimited, the omnipresent, the all-wise, and the all-loving. So in truth, there is one mind, and that mind cannot be separated or divided. It's indivisible. We are one with Father. And I tell people all the time, you don't have a separate mind than your divine mind. So you can't say... I've got a problem in my mind. No, you have a problem in your awareness, in your brain, if you would. Your awareness affects your brain, right? So your brain is not your mind. Now, a lot of scientists and college people would tell me I'm crazy, but that's okay. But the Bible tells me there's only one mind. There's only one power. There's only one body, and we're all one. And so our divine mind is the only creative power, and the fun it functions out of the principle of being, if you would, or the spirit in action. It's one thing to know that I'm spirit, but I want to be spirit in action. I want to live and move and have my being out of my spirit so I can bless people. So who are we? We are the ecclesia, right? The ecclesia, that's the word for church. And the first two letters, eek in there, is the point where spiritual action proceeds. The point is all of us. Spirit flows out of us. We're always wanting God to do something but God wants us to do something. He wants us to release, if you would, if I could say him, release him through us and let spirit flow to the earth. And that's what Jesus did. He never prayed and asked God to do anything. One time he said, I will talk to the Father 
and the Father will spend many more comforter, uh, send many more comforter messengers to lead you and guide you in the things that I try to teach you. But he never asked for healing. He never asked for food. Never, asked, never even asked for God to heal the people he was ministering to. He spoke to them. He said, do you believe? And they said, yes. Then he said, your faith has made you whole. And he raised their energy level to where they can experience their wholeness. So that's why we call our courses that we're doing every few months Ecclesia, because we're looking for people who are ready to wake up to spiritual truth and let spirit flow through them. And so we literally are the point where Father flows and touches the world. And you always hear that you'll never know what God's going to do. I hear that all the time. And people are saying, well, God's going to do something. And what most of them think God's going to do is come back and get them and leave everybody else here. And that's kind of cruel if you ask me. So divine mind is not a thing. Divine mind is, if you would. So when Moses asked Father, who shall I say sent me uh, to Pharaoh? Father spoke to him and said, say I exist that I exist. Because that's what I am means. When you look at am, it says exist. So I exist that I exist sent me. So as a prophet, Moses became a channel to the message, uh, del delivering a proclamation of spirit to Pharaoh. That's what he was. He was a channel of God. Isn't that cool to, be, to know that you are a channel of God? And no matter where you go, you can channel the Father's Spirit to the people at 7-Eleven. The people standing there. You just have to be willing. You have to quit saying, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. You can do all things through contact with the divine mind that strengthens you. You can do that. So messengers are channels. And what we do is we deliver a proclamation of spirit, if you would. And a communication is a reminder to acknowledge the source of all existence. That we acknowledge that Father lives inside of us. And Father lives and moves and has being in us. And we live and move and have our being in and out of Father. So it underscores the idea that Father is not just a deity out there somewhere that we have to bow down and worship. And, you know, Father never, ever expects us to lift our hands and cry. I mean, it's okay, but we don't have to worship God like, a, like we're in fear. And, you know, we were taught to bow our head when we pray, and many of us still do it. And if you want to, but that was a religious thing that was put on us. You do not need to bow your head like in shame. And I know you don't say you're doing it, but that's how it was started. But what, what, the, what the Bible says is Father seeks those who worships him in spirit and truth. And the word, anybody remember what the word worship means? I know you know it. Huh? It starts with A-S, ascer, ascertain, seek, and desire to know. That's what it says. He seeks those that ascertain and seek and desire to know Father in spirit, right? And we were taught in carnal understanding, not spirit. And in truth, and when you look at the word truth, it means the not concealed word. And then the word praise actually means to tell the story of what you learn. So if Donna, if you came to Donna and you wanted to seek and ascertain and know me, then Donna would praise me by telling you, he's the most awesome pa uh, husband you'll ever meet in your life. He's never one time <laughs> hurt me or, isn't that what you would say? <laughs> Something like that, huh? Okay. So... We yield to our divine mind, and then we come to the same experience that the Apostle Paul, had, Apostle Paul had in being in the Spirit, if you would, and John had in being in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And when you're in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, you hear a voice, right? And when is the Lord's Day? It's the day that you do that. It's the day that you wake up. It's the day that you say, Father, I want this experience. I want to experience what it means to be Spirit. And then you hear a voice, and this voice behind you, like John had, he saw God in mankind. He saw one like the Son of Man and the golden candlestick. The golden candlestick was the Ecclesia, in which everybody is the Ecclesia. And so when we wake up, we see people different. First thing we do is see ourselves different. And then when we can see ourselves different, then we see everybody different. Everybody's holy. Everybody's righteous. Even if they're doing bad things. And that's very difficult. We discovered that Hitler, the reason he did what he did, is his dad was Jewish. I didn't know that, but he was Jewish, and his dad was mean, and he raised him to hate people. 
and he did horrible things to Hitler. You wasn't here when I taught that? Yeah. Well, you, you better be reading the transcripts I'm sending you. <laughs> but he, he, he tormented him, and so he hated his dad, and he projected that on all Jewish people, and that's what, one of the reasons he did that. He was still righteous. He was holy. He just didn't know it. But how do people see him? I hope he's burning in hell. Well, what if I put a USB port in your brain and project everything you've ever thought, everything you did for us all to see? Some people might say, I hope you're burning in hell. So we're all sons of God. We're all daughters. Some people just do bad things, and there are consequences for that. I promise you, he suffered greatly. And guess what? There's things that we've done that we've suffered for. Can any of you say that's not true? You can't. We all have. And so no matter what you're feeding on from religiosity or the forms of teaching, we can enter into this by choice the spirit on the Lord's day. And uh, how, do, how do I know, you know, how, how do I know this is real? Because I've experienced the quickening myself. I, I've experienced this quickening sometimes almost every day. Sometimes while I'm asleep, there's a quickening comes and it wakes me up almost. Or I hear Father speak to me in my dreams, but it's not a dream. Uh, and, and of course, while I study and write, but it happens in my yard. It happens in my garden. It happens when I'm driving down the street. Uh, Father speaks constantly. You know, we have a radio tower over here on 4th Street called KOMA. You know what I'm talking about, KOMA? You girls, what, what, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm aging myself. You do, don't you? Absolutely. You know, it's radio. It's a radio station. And it's, it's, it's uh, was it FM? I mean, it was AM. It was AM. The largest entertainment in the world. It went all over the world, and one of our tornadoes knocked it down. After all these years, there was two of them or three of them, but it's still there. There's a smaller one, and there are radio waves coming in here. But can you hear any music right now? No. Nope. But if you were able to tune into it, you could. You could. Well, see, Father Spirit is speaking all the time, everywhere at once, all the time, and Father uh, speaks can speak, the voice can speak to us exactly what we need to hear. That's what's pretty cool about it. But we have to tune in and we have to practice. And I think the greatest thing to do, if you've never heard Father, is be still and be quiet and know. In the Old Testament, it says be still and know, be still and know. And when you look up the word still, it means calm and quiet. How do most people approach God? When I'm saying God on purpose because... How do they do it? They're desperate. They plead. They're not calm. They're not quiet. They're not sure if God will answer their prayers. And they beg and they beg and they beg and they beg. And you can't hear anything that way. You know, but if you're calm and quiet, there will be, there, sooner or later you're going to hear that thought come to you. But you're going to hear it more and more and more. And so next here we find there are eight places from which all people need to return of which religiosity drove them off to. And, and again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there is Syria again, there's Egypt, there's Pathros, there's Cush, there's Elam, there's Shinar, there's Hamoth, and the islands of the sea. Uh, Egypt represents the world, if you would. Pathros is dryness. I'm not going to go through all of them. Cush is darkness. Islands of the sea are just being off by yourself. How many people are just off there by themselves today? They've given up. They don't want to hear anything anymore. But what's interesting about eight, eight is the number of new beginnings. And then I researched it, and there's many more meanings to it. It means splendor. It means fullness. It means greatness. It means immensity and infinity. And so allegorically, I put allegorically, Donna, help me correct that too. (laughs) I edit these later on, but I type too fast. So allegorically, the eighth day means when you become aware that the I exists in you as Father. You become aware that it's your source, it's your essence, it's your chi, it's your life force. You become aware of that, and you know without a shadow of a doubt that your entire source is Father. It's not the bank. It's not, it's not uh, mom and daddy. It's not your church. It's nothing, it's your Father that's your source for all things, all knowledge and all understanding. Now, am I telling you you need to leave your teachers or leave? No, you don't leave them, but you just realize they have the same source you do. And guess what? You can be in a church all your life 
and that pastor never really wake up and then you but you can begin to hear things that he's not hearing or she's not hearing and you have to be careful sometimes because if you go tell them about it sometimes that's oh those things are dangerous right no you don't you know we don't want to know about these things until we go to heaven someday but you don't need to depend have all your put all your understanding on just a pastor you need to go home and meditate on these things and and allow spirit to lead you down a path because i always look forward to the day that my students come to me and share something they learned that i didn't know and that happens quite often quite often i can't imagine it but it does <laughs> no i'm sorry so as you tune in with the infinite and you know the life principle of the father of all and of all people then you realize that all people are your sisters and your brothers, no matter who they are. That's when you can look at somebody that did something really bad and you can feel sorry for them. That's hard to do. But that's my brother, that's my sister. Something happened to them. They, something made them have a mistaken identity. Something caused them to be mentally ill. Something, something put rage in them. And most of the church world wants to say it's the devil, and that's a lie, because there's no such thing. You know, you look it up, and it's the, the Greek for devil is dubalos, and it's, uh, it means to traduce or hinder. The only time Jesus used that was when he was talking about the Pharisees, or the law, you are of your father the traducer, the hinder. Uh, he used it with Peter when Peter said, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. He said, to get me behind me, traducer, you're hindering me from my intended purpose. And then the other one was Damion, and Damion is a supernatural spirit of a bad character. Are we not supernatural? Yes. If we're one with Father, supernatural means other than just physical. We're spiritual. But because of religiosity, because of where our parents raised us or whatever, we took on a bad character. We wasn't living out of who we know we are. And we've all been there, right? Every one of us have been there. So we... Uh, we claim that which is true of Father is also true of us, and then we live our life like Jesus did. Jesus came to show us the way. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't saying, I am the way to Father. He said, I'm showing you the way to live. I'm showing you the truth. I'm showing you the life that belongs to you. I'm here to be an example of that. But you, you are already with Father. I've been taught that you can't get to Father without Jesus. Well, I'm already with Father. Amen. I was born with Father. Did you know when a, a pregnancy takes place, when the sperm hits the egg, there's an explosion of light? You ever heard of that? You can look it up on YouTube. It's a huge explosion of light. And what is light? Spirit. God is light. The Bible says that. God, it said God is the Father of lights. So literally the very Spirit of God entered that egg and quickened it to everything it's supposed to be right then. Every time I tell this story, it gives me goosebumps because that's amazing to know that and to understand that. So I don't have to do anything to become like God. I don't have to do anything to please God. God's already pleased with me. I was thinking about this yesterday. In 1988, do you remember anything big that was projected to happen in 1988? What was it, Ann? The war's coming back. That, a rapture, another rapture. Oh. Back. So 1988, there were a people supposedly having a second-hand ministry to come to them. People were waking up. 1988, Brother Garner had his experience for the Lord. Just He said, turn him upside down and dumped everything out. It was supposed to continue on to wake up, but he, 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 went, he stepped out of the first part of outer court and he went into the redemptive view area and he taught it very well. He was a great teacher. But that's what happened to him. 1988, I had a big experience. Everything changed in my life. Father told me if I would give up a lot of things in my life and I had prayed and asked Father to help me to study. And all of a sudden I just became unsatiable, hungry. hungry. Yeah. And I ended up with an 850 book library and they were commentaries of all things. Boring as books you can ever read in your life. But I wanted to learn. Lots of ministers said in 1988 they had a transition to come up higher. But a lot of them were not spirit-led hand ministries, and so they began to propagate the rapture doctrine again. 
So there was a man that wrote 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. People bought his books by the thousands. They were terrified. I was working for Bob Mills at the general manager then, furniture, and some of my salespeople would come and begging me to get them saved. I remember in the back room, several of them, I would pray with them and and I, you know, I say, I don't believe this is going to happen, but you, you know, you need to get saved anyways. And so January 1st, they went right back to sinning. <laughs> Jokey there. But so that, that happened. And then he ends up uh, in, uh, after January, he takes off to Caribbean to some plush estate and living happily ever after. You know, so father's always raising people up to hire. But if you don't go to the right place, or you don't let Father lead you to the right place, you're going to get a hand ministry that's not spirit-led. And they're called teachers, they're called preachers, they're called what gurus or whatever, that they seem to have a good message, but they're not bringing you to a place of real peace. You know, one of our friends told me about how she went to one of them. The guy spoke to her and said, that I see darkness in you. Well, a hand ministry wouldn't do that. Somebody anointed of God would put that fear on you, you know, and make you feel like you're possibly demon possessed or you've done something wrong. And a hand ministry wouldn't tell you that you're a sinner and you need to get saved either, right? So the hand ministry had spirit in them because everybody does, but they heard what they heard was skewed, it was distorted, and it was wrongly expressed because of their upbringing or their education and religious system. And yes, we possess a measure of truth. But if it's only a measure of truth, what is it? It's leaven. The rest of it's leaven. And the Bible talks about leaven. If you, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump, right? You ladies, you cook and you use leaven. So you don't have to put a lot in there, right? And so the leaven that we used to say was, was sin, plurals, actually is sin singular, which is a mistaken identity. You know, lying, cheating, cussing, all that other stuff, that's just, that's just the results of the sin. You get rid of the sin, all that stuff goes away, right? That's all you got to do is correct people's identity, and you don't have to sit there and deal with smoking and ice cream and all that stuff, whatever it is. You just teach them who they are. And whatever you're getting out of that, you can get from your relationship with Father. If ice cream gives you peace, but you're eating too much of it, and it's it's making you sick or whatever. There's another source that it's just, when you think you need ice cream, why don't you just sit along and meditate for a while? When you think you, you, you want to watch TV and you've been through 99 channels and nothing satisfies you and you want, you, well, maybe I need to read a book and there's nothing there you want. Then you go, to, well, maybe I'm hungry. And you go to the refrigerator. There's nothing there. You might think, you know what? Maybe it's Father who's calling me to come up and have a conversation with Father. Be calm. And being quiet. And so Western evangelical Christianity and other sources instructs, uh, instruction is, is from man whose senses come from the carnal understanding. In Isaiah, there's a verse that says, See she from man whose breath is in his nostrils. What that's saying is, See she from carnally minded, a carnally minded person who gets his understanding from his five senses. And it says, what account, of, uh, what account is he of? In other words, they're not worth listening to. And that's a pretty tough thing to say because I used to be that way. So scripture mentions leaven, the leaven of Pharisees and Herod, in Mark eight fifteen. It represents limited thoughts, limited thoughts. And they speak of the hand ministries that are not under the control of the divine mind. So when we attempt to confine the divine law to religiosity, what the Pharisees taught, if you would, and we scoff at anything beyond that, you know, we're letting the leaven of the Pharisees work in us. And there are people that are scoffing at what we're teaching today. They mock it. They make fun of it. Our, our, our parents, my mom, my mom literally told me every, and that was when I was teaching the redemptive work. I mean, just that. And my mom told me everybody that's listened to me is going to go to hell. And they scoffed at it. So the leaven of the Pharisees was working in her. All that religious teaching that she had all of her life, it had worked in her and it keeps working in her and it keeps working until literally it brings you to your end. So when we allow the forces of carnal intellect uh, to fulfill its lust appetite, if you would, we're tolerating the leaven and it's, again, it works to our undoing. 
and too many people are, to are tolerating the lie in their life. Be because why? Because it's familiar. It's because what they heard all their life. My aunt told me, I don't care what you say, what my mama believed, it was good enough for her, it's good enough for me. And we have a friend once that told me about how he was Baptist bred, Baptist raised, and I'll be Baptist till I die, but I sure like what you preach. <laughs> Remember Frank? He was funny. So, what time is it? I don't want to go too much. Okay, a few more minutes. But when our heart awareness and our consciousness are raised, it's done by affirmation. We affirm Father's uh, omnipresent substance of life. Omnipresent means everywhere. So we need to have affirmations that we say, Father, you are here. You're always with me. But you're also always with everybody else. And that you are, you are true substance. You are true life. And we, we allow ourselves to be fed on that. And when we're fed on that, then there's the eternal supply. When Kay first taught it, and I did, and I wrote the book on living out of our spiritual resources, one chapter talks about true supply, where literally we lack nothing whatsoever. Now, some people read that, and they'll say, oh, well, I'm going to start seeing myself with pockets full of money. That's not true supply. True supply means you can, you can make it even if you just have $10 in your checking account. You don't have to look at your checking account to determine whether you're going to make it or not. You just know that whatever is required tomorrow, it will just be there. And you can't just say, okay, I'm going to do that. It comes from a, a knowing. You have to have that revealed to you, which I did one time. But literally, well, when we meditate on this, the omnipresence of Father, Father is everywhere at once. Father is in every situation in my life. And when you know that, then, then you have this eternal supply. You have peace. You have comfort, you have supply in every area that you need it. So whatever false line of thought received in our consciousness, literally, if we allow the spirit, the spirit will go to the root of that and remove it from us and shine a light on it and destroy it. You know, I could turn all the light off in this room and shut the curtains and it can get dark and you girls can jump up and start binding it and rebuking it and command it. It's not going to leave. The only thing that's going to cause it to leave is turn the light on. And we spend all of our life binding stuff and rebuking. How many went into charismatic churches, Pentecostal? Y'all did? You guys never did? You did? So you know what I'm talking about. And we're demanding the devil to get out of this person or get out of our life or whatever, when all we needed is somebody to come and turn the light on. And it's, it's just that simple. So the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, Mark 13, 33, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. So when a word of truth seems to be hidden in our awareness, literally it's not idle. It's still there. God's spirit is still in you. And I believe it's still working until that day. What day? The day that you wake up. Because it's not dormant inside of If we have the divine mind, it's there. And there are gentle nudgings, you know, gentle things that take place in our life. We hear things, and if we don't cast them down, if we don't think that it's, uh, oh, that's the devil, <laughs> you know. Like my uncle always said, Roy, you, sh you, you should not be seeking, uh, looking for signs and uh, symbols in Scripture. That's dangerous, you know. And I understood where he came from. He came from a very religious church. So I said, okay, thank you, and I just continued to do it. So what do we do? We feed on the Logos, not the written word. And I'm, I'm going to be really bold here at saying this. Just sitting down reading the Bible does nothing for you. It literally brings condemnation to you. It literally will make you feel less than. And you're always going to look for something else to please God because literally it tells you that God's not pleased with you. He loves you one moment and he does it the next moment. I was talking to Sunshine about this earlier that one of the words in the Bible that they put in there is wrath. Another one is indignation. And it talked about the wrath of God and the indignation of God. And we feared that wrath coming on us. And it talked about travailing a woman in birth with the wrath of God. And when you look it up, it literally is the orge. It's, it's the intimate love and longing of God. And travail means birth them. How do you birth people to know who Father is? Talk to them about the love of God. That, that's what the whole gospel is about, is the love of God. So this process continues when you, when you meditate. And uh, 
I say this all the time, but the scripture says in, in the Old Testament, meditate on the word day and night. And I always add the, less time, the rest of the time, do what you want. <laughs> but we, you can meditate anywhere you're at. That means you're just thinking on something. To dwell. But make sure it's the Logos. Make sure it's, it's the living word of truth. And uh, and you can hear you can read it in, in sacred scriptures, but there are some sacred scriptures out there that aren't not called Bible. They're from the Middle East. There's all kinds of sacred scriptures out there, but it must be found. And I'm just saying this: if you don't believe it, it's okay. But it must be founded on what Jesus taught, because Jesus was the greatest comforter messenger there ever was, and it must be founded on that. Many of my books that go back from way back in the 1400s, the 1500s, 1600s, have some great master comforter teachers that taught, but they always reference what Jesus taught, and they always explain it. So it's important for us to understand that. My first 53 years of my life were feeding on those type of hand ministries, 1988 to 20, 2003, and I became one myself. But still, Father was constantly pulling, up, pulling me up higher, I was a questioner. I always questioned. My pastor struggled with it, you know. And so I was there, and I, I had taught the finished work of Jesus Christ and the redemptive work. I've got probably 150 books on those if I published all of them. But then after my pastor, my hand ministry that was teaching the redemptive work, after he passed away, then I, are you doing what I think you're doing, Donna Faye? <laughs> I'm going to get you. She, uh, I was connected with Kay Fairchild, very good friend of Brother Garner. She had been sick, so we didn't get to see her a lot. But I got connected with her, and we both began to talk about the Scripture. And unbeknownst to us, Father was bringing us up higher. And next thing you know, I tell Kay, I told my congregation, we need to learn how to live out of our spirit. Because I just finally got tired of it. Like, this isn't changing anybody. They're, 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 I'm teaching these truths, and they're, we're no different than the people that we called sinners, right? And that's the truth. And so next thing you know, about a month or two later, Kay calls me. She said, I'm teaching a series called Living Out of Our Spiritual Resources. And it just lit my fire, literally changed my life. All of a sudden, revelation began to get brighter and brighter. And all of a sudden, I realized there's no end to what's available to us today if we will just tap into the divine mind. And so that's important for us to know. Uh, I only got through my 11 pages out of 19, so I won't make y'all go through 19 pages. <laughs> we'll just keep going through this until we're done. But this book is so powerful, and what Father is showing us and going to show us, I think it's going to help us with people. Because you guys have a big influence out there. A lot of, a lot of women, and I'm sure some men, that are really going to a lot of different places looking for truth. And I want you to be able to explain it to them. You don't have to say, well, my pastor said, or my teacher said, I want you to be able to say, the scripture says this. And that's why I like to send these transcripts to you too. But what person wouldn't get help from what we're learning? What person wouldn't want to hear that they're already righteous and they're already holy? And you never had to give anything. You never had to say anything. You never had to do anything to please God. You were just pleasing your church. And we don't attack the church. The people. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm just saying the system's corrupt. And all the other systems are corrupt. The religious, the political, the financial, the medical, and the social. It's all about greed and control and power. And what do they have to do to control you? Produce fear. Is that not true? And every one of them produce fear. And fear is not from Father. Not, not at all. So... I hope you enjoyed this. Anybody got any questions on it? Nope. Yes. So you talk about um, the Father a lot, but it says to get to the Father, you have to go through Jesus. That's King so James. I'd love for your okay. I'd love for you to just give your background on on that, on that. on removing Jesus. From okay. Well, I'm not removing Jesus at all, but Jesus. Jesus was a comforter messenger. And I mean, that's what scripture talks about. A comforter messenger is somebody that teaches you about God and explains things to you about God. So the whole Bible is about an awareness. It's about an awareness. And the lens that you read it with is love. 
And whatever you read, if it doesn't fit God's love, which is, ag which is agape. You ever heard of agape love? Agape love is love without a cause. So if I tell you, I meet you, I'm a young man, and I tell you, I love you because you're so beautiful, you're so trim, and you look so nice, and I want to marry you. And 20 years later, you gain about 50 pounds, you know, and you get wrinkles on you, and that's not there anymore. If I loved you just because of that, then I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't love you anymore. And so God's love, there's no because to it. God loves us just, we're God's children. We are God. God loves himself. So if you're reading the Bible, so if it says we can't come to God because of Jesus, without Jesus, that's not love. That's not love at all. But is God saying it's through his teachings that it's, we It's just that to we him. know him, not get to him, him, that we know him. Because you are already, you already have God. You're one with God. Scripture, all through the Scripture, tells us that we are one. The Lord our God is one. Every place that says you shall be, it says you exist righteous. And uh, and um, well, I forget the verse, the but there's huh? One. The Father, Son, and the Spirit are one. We are we are one. See, I don't teach the Trinity. Yeah. That, that's a Catholic doctrine. But there's a verse in uh, I think it's Malachi. It says. In the King James, it says, we shall live in his sight. Okay. The word shall is exist. And the, uh, and the word uh, sight is the plural of a noun. So literally it says, we exist as the plural of God. And Jesus even said, ye are gods. He said, your scripture says that ye are gods. And there's other places that says ye are gods. Now, we're not God Almighty, but we are gods we are god made us in his image so we are gods in this earth we have dominion over this earth but you you were born holy and you weren't taught that way we thought we were born sinners and we were not and so we're so jesus came to reveal god to us the pharisees failed at it the first hand ministries failed at it they they mixed law and religion moses grew uh was raised in uh in egypt worshipped all kinds of gods and studied mytho uh, mythological and paganistic teaching that had the Ten Commandments. There's all kinds of religions that had the Ten Commandments. He was struggling with the children of Israel. They wouldn't mind him. They wouldn't obey him. So he went up and got a law that says, God's going to spank you. And he came up with the Ten Commandments. That wasn't from God. God never said that. God never said circumcise a man. Why would God say take that skin off and God put it on there? But Moses said, God said this. Abraham said, God said this. Uh, and when it said that uh, Abraham was told to bring Isaac up to the mountain, sacrifice him, that was all mistranslated in the scripture. God just wanted him to come up with his son. And God wanted to say, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't need sacrifice. Over and over and over the scripture, God's trying to say, I am love. I am love. Don't believe this junk that they're telling you. But they wouldn't listen. The word obey means to listen with intelligence, with understanding. So Jesus came to save that which was lost, and we were taught that means we were all lost. But that which was lost was man's awareness. They didn't know who God was, and they didn't know who they were. And so when we sat in church, it was reinforced over and over and over. And think about this, sunshine. I'm sure you went and prayed a sinner's prayer once and got saved, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what were you before that happened? You were a sinner, right? So, well, I, mean, I mean, that's what they said. So what were you after that happened? You were still a sinner saved by grace. You were still a sinner, according to them. That's what I'm saying. That's what they said. I mean, I feel like I grew up, like you said, I mean, we grew up, we're born pure. Yes. And I think I knew that as a little girl. Good. But I didn't know religion okay. until my mom started sending me off. How old were you then? I always had the faith of a little, you know, like I prayed and I... You just knew it. I just knew well, see, God, you were you were in touch with who you were, but but and then we're corrupted by the world. Yeah, the corrupted world. by the law and religion and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it affected us, and we didn't know who we were, and we didn't have ministers that knew who they were. So it wasn't their fault; they didn't know who they were. And a lot of a lot of ministry when they get out of a seminary school, they stop studying. Mm -hmm. They just study to get a sermon, and I did it. And they they whatever's going on in the church, that's what they're going to preach on, like. People quit tithing, so I'm going to preach on tithing next week. Or they're not serving in the church, so I'm going to preach on serving. And we never did anything to help people to find out who they really were. And we've been, the Bible says, we've been like a woman travailing to give birth, and all we've done is brought forth wind. That's a, you know what that is? It stinks. 
It's winds of doctrine. And so today we're giving birth to people's awareness to know that there are sons and daughters of God and they've always been. And it's hard, I know. But what we teach is like, it's like telling you one plus one is three. And the redemptive view is like telling people that too, where Jesus died for our sins, he died for everyone, and, and everybody, you know, and there are people that fought that. I mean, I was called a heretic for preaching crucified, died, very quick, and raised and seated because people did not believe it at all. So it's, uh, I could share a lot more with you, but there's so much scripture that I found that's been mistranslated that's just absolutely not true. The Catholic religion, the Church of England, they translated the Bible from, uh, from uh, Latin to German, and then they translated it to English, and they controlled the translations. They added words. Uh, let me end this real quick. I'm going to tell you some more. So I, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard me talk about this before, so I'm going to close this out. But we appreciate you being here. We love you. Uh, this will be on YouTube by next week, and then I'll put it on my podcast, and we'll be back here next Sunday, and I'll finish this chapter. So God bless you. Thank you.